Um, I call the member for Bowman. Uh, thanks, Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank you to the previous speaker for a very powerfully read speech. Uh, but I will be disappointing her because we won't be supporting this tax, and there's a very, very simple reason why. Uh, and apart from the very unique conditions in the 1970s when we did have the petroleum resource rent tax, it has not been the habit of the Australian government to hack into sectors when it looks like they're doing very well and try and capture some of those surpluses in one sector at the exclusion of others. We've always had, like most countries in the world, an economy-wide income tax, an economy-wide withholding tax, an economy-wide uh, company tax, and that is by far the best way to protect in an increasingly internationalised world of trade and commerce uh, the golden goose that's laying the egg for Australia. And let's make no mistake about just how important that sector is to Australia the tens of billions of dollars that are being generated through the mining sector, and it's just a little too cheap. It's just a little too easy for a government to say, gee, wouldn't I love another cut of that? Because the bottom line is that if mining is doing well, Australia does well, and we reap the benefits. What we don't need are little exceptional rules for each sector when they're doing well. We don't need to go to the banking sector and say, gee, they were good profits last year. Why do we hack into that as well? It's a very simple principle that all sectors have an Australia-wide company tax system and it works exceptionally well. Now, I can understand that many in the gallery may well say, but it looks like a cheap of very source money. There's not much that those big nasty mining companies can do about it. All those profits being repatriated overseas, it's almost irresistible to delve into this sector and try and uh, scrape back, hack back, claw back just that little bit more to help what? to help pay for our out-of-control spending, of course, and that is the motivation that we know very, very well. This is, and everyone knows it, it's no great secret, this is a government that's never balanced their books. It's a government that's never balanced the budget in the time that they've been in government. And the whole problem with this continual proposition of taxes from this government is that they're only trying to cover up their out-of-control spending. And the problem for this government is that every tax that they conceive of and dream up never quite covers up the taxes, never quite covers up their, their runaway spending. And this is the great problem as they negotiate this, this uh, uh, MMRT, is that they simply can see, even by 2019-20, the mining tax itself won't be large enough to even commit to covering one commitment, which is the increase in superannuation for workers. $3.6 billion that will cost in that year, but the mining tax is projected only to raise three. Of course, that's a decade away. We don't need to think about that now. But this is a government not mesmerised, not preoccupied, but no, Deputy Speaker, utterly fixated on dreaming up new taxes to just partially cover up their out of control spending. And it's on that platform we're having this debate today. And I just want to make three very simple points. The first one is the government is repeatedly referring to these non renewable resources uh, as if one day we will wake up and they will all be gone as if there will come a time when we've dug up everything and Australia simply has no more to give the world, and nothing could be further from the truth. The second misconception over here is that these, these uh, minerals can only be dug up once. I mean, again, a very mistaken conception, as we've known through the history of gold exploration, that no sooner have you left a mine, the prices change, and the very tailings you've dug up suddenly become a gold mine again. We have no idea what the prices of resources will be 10, 20 and 30 years from now. We only know that on current levels of exploration and predictions on price that we actually can arrive at estimates of resource life. Well, let me quote the people who know best. And I don't need to uh, you know, restrict my comments to just the coal and the iron ore that are under consideration in this bill. But black coal is projected in 2008 to last for 90 years, and then the following year it was revised to 100 years. That's 100 years, 100 years of black coal and 4.7 centuries of brown coal. Now, no one's going to say we are going to be exhausting those reserves, but the notion that, gee, we better capture some of the resources uh, in a, through a rent tax on coal before it runs out is completely spurious. I mean, coal will be around in this country long after we've shifted off coal and onto something else. Okay? The second point is iron ore. Iron ore, a 70-year life. I mean, 70 years from now, when we're moving into the next century, we'll actually be talking about completely different materials doing what iron ore does right now. I don't know what they are, but the one thing I'm pretty sure of is that we are not facing a situation where our resources will run out tomorrow. Let me go through them. Bauxite, 85 years. Copper, 95 years. Uh, working my way down the list, lead, 55 years. Mineral sands from my own electorate, uh, ilmenite, 
110 years, nickel 145 years, uranium 140 years. My simple point is I don't think we need to panic today about those resources being there for a significant period of time. What we do need to do in these circumstances, and I think most people viscerally get it, even though it's tempting to say we'd love a bigger slice of the pie, I think it's, it's the job of governments here to say, how do we make this pie bigger? How do I guarantee that your kids can get a job in that sector? How do I make sure the actions of this lot over here don't lead to uh, a simple shift, what we call the internal shift in investment, to other continents where there isn't this mining tax in place. I mean, two otherwise equal reserves, one in Africa with no mineral tax and one in Australia with, will distort investment decisions. I need to make sure the next big investment in mining and in that mine occurs here in Australia. I want the next big piece of plant and equipment right here. And with due respect to the government, I'm not going to say that all investment will stop with a mining tax. But there only needs to be one, two and three per cent distortions, perverse investments as a result of tax and sovereign risk by this government to be enough to affect the jobs of people sitting up there and their family. Okay? So it's not hysterical claims of closing the sector down. No, even the mining companies don't say that. But what I do know is that the one, the two and the three per cent, the ability of this nation to supply China and India needs to be allowed to take its own path under the existing income tax rules of the land. It serves us perfectly well. It doesn't serve a government that can't control its spending, but it serves everyone else perfectly well. It served every other previous administration of this country, Deputy Speaker, perfectly well. But no, 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 not this lot. No, they're out of control. They've got more promises to meet. They've got more special interest groups to suck up to. And the only way to do it is to come up with new taxing ideas. And typically, it's finding a sector that can't fight back. It's finding a sector that the average person on the street says, yeah, have a hook at them. That'd be OK. I'd love to get some of their resources. I'd love to capture some of what they've got. I want to do a bit of naked rent seeking on the mining sector. Easy target, aren't they? And that's why we're having this debate today. So just like that promise in mid-2010 on the carbon tax, the government that lost its way on borders and the government that has lost its way on mining tax, we are here debating something that I believe is slightly better than what the previous Prime Minister came up with, but barely, because there has been no consultation with industry, no agreement reached with the states who up until now have been responsible for collecting the royalties on mining, and most of it has been done in secret, excluding sectors of the mining, uh, the mining uh, population, including small miners. I mean, why does the government have to do that? I mean, why simply can't a, mi can't a government speak to miners as a whole, speak publicly about it, take the recommendations of their own Ken Henry and implement them? But oh no, 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 that's too messy. That's too exquisitely painful. We'd rather do a deal with the big three pre-election and leave everyone out of the equation. That's a new way of government working, isn't it? I mean, that's an interesting way leaving out thousands of miners, or in the case of iron ore and coal, um, hundreds of operators. But the basic thing we ask, I think, as Australians is not so much consultation, but the basic, the basic principle of engagement, of actually coming and talking about the impact it will have. But if you go and visit a mining site in Western Australia, they will tell you, we've never seen a Labor person up here. I mean, short of someone flying in in a Learjet and flying back out again in the VIP jet, you know, do we see Labor members actually coming up and learning about Australia's greatest export sector? They get lost there. They never go there. It's almost like they don't want to go and talk about it. Now, I respect that there is significant interest and some support for a mining tax when I talk to people in the street. But the simple fact is that previous administrations never scraped that low. No, the income tax system of Australia was satisfactory to run our economy. And I've talked about the one exception to that, which was a unique one in setting up uh, activities in the North West Shelf at a time when capital was extremely difficult to secure. What we have is, again, the federal government trampling over the states. We know this is predominantly a Western Australian and Queensland issue. And again, an inability to even get agreement with Labor states. I mean, we're talking about renegade states who are from that other side of politics. No, no, no. These are Labor states who can't come to an agreement on this tax. So all in all, there may be an ability of people on the other side to cobble together deals and get independence to support this bill. I can understand that. I can understand that at the most superficial level there's some attraction to be able to see big dollar signs in front of your eyes, but I just implore the Australian people, see this government for what it is. Well, no, you already do see this government for what it is, but look even more closely on this issue. 
for a government that simply cannot contain its spending, cannot contain its fiscal hemorrhaging and cannot make a, a, a truly tough decision around pulling back the money that they provide uh, to different parts of the economy to which they feel they owe something. They are fed effectively now making our federal budget utterly hostage to what state and territory governments do. That's also a significant concern because there is no ability of this place anymore to talk about where we will be with a balanced budget in 2030 and 14. That's not good. And then lastly, of course, you're basically sucking 25 of the $38 billion out of a single state with no agreement about how that is best done and no agreement about how that state will benefit. Look, I, I think it's fairly reasonable to ask for an open and transparent process. N-O. That hasn't happened. Has it been inclusive of small miners? N-O. Anyone who truly thinks about this should really expect better of their own government. The right thing is for this lot to go back and do it again. Do it again properly. We don't want deals around Chinese restaurant tables and smoky rooms where you cut a deal with the big three miners. No, I'd like them to talk to the Australian miners, the Australians that are domiciled here, to the shareholders that actually support the innovative and fast-growing risk-taking Australian companies. No, 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 that was all too messy, wasn't it? They've been left out. So please, I think I speak on behalf of many Australians to this government. Get your spending under control. Yeah, that's the big issue, isn't it? If we could actually get the spending under control, we wouldn't need these distortionary taxes. It is almost impossible for us to convince those on the other side that mining is, in fact, an international enterprise. We live in a world of globalised and internationalised uh, trade and commerce and, of course, mining effort. And the temptation for major miners, who are, after all, no way do they want to remain exposed to the sovereign risk of Australia. They're involved in South America. They're involved in Africa. They simply do internal supply changes. They invest in Africa just that little bit more, but it's enough to cost jobs. And just never forget that three years ago, what did we always hear from Labor on this side? Guarantee that no single worker will be worse off under your extreme laws. Well, these guys cannot guarantee that for any single worker working in any Australian mine as a result of this mining um, MMRT. So I would urge every Australian to wake up to the reality of what's ho happening over here. We can have lower, simpler and fairer taxes. It will be delivered by this side of politics and we will do everything we can to draw this government back to the fundamental problem they face, and that is their inability to restrain their spending.